Hello everyone. In this session, we will understand in detail about the subroutines within the control memory, within the microprogrammed control unit. You know that a subroutine is actually needed when a main routine calls it. There is a function, another function, f1 and f2. When f1 calls f2, f2 could be the subroutine for f1. Once after the f2 is finished, to the f1, there will be a return. After which f1 will resume its execution. But why in the control memory, we do require subroutines? Why microprogrammed control unit will facilitate with the subroutines? What is the actual motive behind that? Let us understand. You know already that the subroutines are the programs that are used by the other routines. When a routine is getting executed, that may require a subroutine to be executed. Then a call to be made to that specific subroutine. Once after the subroutine gets executed, as I told you earlier, there will be a return made to the main routine from where the subroutine has been called. Subroutines can be called from any point within the main body of the microprogram. Micro instructions can be saved by the subroutines that use common section of the microcode, what it is. We have seen some op code routines in the previous session in which a specific op code routine when it gets executed, corresponding op code will get executed, right? But during the execution of the every instruction, some things will always be in common. That is, let us say fetch. A fetch operation is going to be performed in common for every instruction. If you want to execute any instruction, make sure that the fetch operation is going to be performed. That is the reason why fetch is a common section of code for every instruction. So the fetch can be available within the subroutine section of the control memory. So that every time, once after the instruction has been finished, Obviously, the control will get transferred to the fetch routine within the control memory. Once after the fetch routine has been executed, then to the opcode routine, there will be a, a mapping function. Let us see how does it go. The first 64 words contains opcode routines. Next 64 words contains subroutines. Now let us say fetch is available at the 64th location, 64, 65, 66, 67 addresses does belong to the fetch routine. Here in this context, you need to understand something very carefully that every time to start the instruction execution, the initial thing that need to be executed within the microprogrammed control unit is the fetch routine. That is. The routine in between 64 to 67 should always be executed as a first thing during the instruction execution. Let us say in the main memory, in the main memory, 23rd instruction has been finished. What is the next job? We need to execute 24th instruction, but in order to execute the 24th instruction, we need to fetch it. For fetch operation, I do have a routine within the control memory. That routine is available within 64, 65, 66, 66, 67 rather. So right after the first instruction execution, some instruction execution, control should automatically be transferred to the 64th location of the control memory since right from this particular point of period, right from this address, we do have the fetch routine is stored and fetch routine is needed to be executed for fetching an instruction from the main memory to the CPU, unless we cannot initiate the instruction execution at all. So every time for the instruction execution, we need to execute the fetch routine. After fetch routine, the instruction will be available within the instruction register. Then we can have a mapping process. What is the mapping process? You already know what is the mapping process. Leave the first zero, leave the least two, two zeros, then map to the remaining four digits. After mapping process has been done, the four digit opcode will be mapped to the corresponding seven digit address within the control memory. Then the opcode routine will get executed. So right now you need to understand that this fetch routine is common for every instruction. 
Similarly, there is something called indirect memory access. Indirect memory access um, routine is needed for those instructions for which the operands are said to be in the indirect addressing mode. For all those indirect addressing mode operands, there has to be an indirect routine executed within the control memory. So, the operations that are in common for every instruction will be available as the subroutine section within the control memory. Micro instruction can be saved by subroutines that use the common section of the micro code. In the memory reference, operand can have the effective address in the indirect format so that at that specific point of period, we need to execute an indirect routine. Subroutine must have a provision for storing the written address during the subroutine call, restoring the address during the subroutine return. We have already seen this in the sequence. Let us have a look at that. When a subroutine has been called, a branch address will be made, right? A branch address can be taken. For this multiplexer, for the sequencer, once again, there are four inputs. One is the next instructions address, that is CAR plus one. Second one is subroutine registers input. The third one is mapping set, mapping code. The fourth one is branch address. Let us say the control address register at this point of period, at this point of period is 23, is executing 23. Now this 23rd address is calling, this 23rd instruction is calling a subroutine. At that time, the next instruction, instruction cannot be 24. 24 will have to be saved. This will be incremented and it will get stored in the subroutine register. And then the branch address will be taken and we will go to the specific branch location of the subroutine. Then after the execution of the subroutine, we should be able to return back to the previous routine from where the subroutine has been called. We know that that is available in the subroutine register. By allowing the subroutine register's value to this multiplexer as an output, then we'll be able to return back to the previous routine from where the subroutine has been called. Once again, if you want to call the subroutine, the current routine's next address must be saved. Where we are saving? In the subroutine register. Incrementing CAR, CAR holds the current instructions address. Increment CAR, generally if there is no subroutine, obviously CAR plus one will be taken in order to finish the routine. But when we need to branch to a subroutine, the CAR plus one must be saved in the subroutine register. The moment a subroutine gets executed, we will take the value of the subroutine register as an output from this multiplexer. So a return will be successfully made. This is what exactly the things that are needed when a subroutine call has been made. Subroutine must have a provision for storing the return address during the subroutine call, restoring the address during the subroutine return. This can be accomplished by using, by using a register in which the return address will get saved. Okay. So generally, you know that we are going to use a system stack in which the contents will be extracted out in a LIPO format. The first content that is that has been pushed will be available at the base of the stack. The final content that has been pushed will be available at the top of the stack. This is our stack. Stack is a linear data structure in which the content which is pushed first will be retrieved last, which is pushed last will be retrieved first. Let us say F1 calls F2. F1's return address is available here. Then F2 calls F3. Then F2 return address is here. F3 calls F4. Then F4 return address will be here. F4 calls F5. Then this is F3. Then this is F4. Now, from F5, there hasn't been any, any more subroutine call. So right from the F5, rather right after F5, we should, return, we should be able to return back to F4. Simply if we say pop, F4's return address will be popped out, after which we'll be able to resume F4. Once after the F4 is finished, then we are going to perform one more pop operation. Here, the top of the stack shows F3's return address. Then F3 will get finished, after which we are going to perform a pop operation once again in order to return back to F2. After F2 gets executed, now, F1, which is at the base of the stack, will be popped out 
f1 is written address will be popped out after which f1 is allowed to be finished so every time when you want to perform a subroutine call or a return it is always better to use a stack rather than using a single location single location is susceptible to be overwritten let us say there is only one register to store to store the return address let us say f1 calls f2 f1 will be here let us say f2 calls f3 at this time this f2's return address is going to overwrite f1 which is highly impossible now in the nested subroutine calls if you use only a single register for storing the return address obviously the previous return address will be overwritten by the current return address so always it is better to use a stack even in the control memory rather than using a single subroutine register we will use a leaf or stack in which the last return address will be available as a topmost content so that you will be able to retrieve it in order to exactly return back to the previous routine from where the current subroutine has been called this is the thing with the subroutine mainly the thing is this subroutine section of the control memory is going to hold a common section for every instruction for an example for common section for every instruction is fetch section a fetch operation should always be performed for every instruction unless the instruction cannot be get into the processor's register similarly for an instruction if the operand is in the indirect addressing mode again that should be available within the common section so that when that specific routine the indirect routine gets executed the memory will be accessed twice in order to get the actual operand this is all about subroutines thank you